the symbols being like straightened out like that is kind of weird. Uh, I don't know if that's something I want to do. A little bit, but. I turned 65 a couple years ago and I got a doctor and we're doing a whole bunch of testing and one of the tests they want to give me is a test in audiology. Well, you're going to recognize you guys are going to have an audiology test today because that speaker is not working. So maybe you put the headphones on and go, can you hear out of that, that side? Nothing out of that side at all. So the speaker is right here. So what you're hearing is not unusual. As we begin worship, have you guys ever studied math and remembered the principles you learned growing up in math? Like, how about this one? Do you guys know the Pythagorean theorem? What is the, oh, please. Okay, who, who said that? Joyce. What is the Pythagorean theorem? Okay, A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Now, most people forget principles for a couple reasons. First off, you didn't, maybe you didn't learn the principle because when you were being taught it, you, weren't being, you didn't pay attention. That was me. They taught stuff, I'm going, I'm not paying attention. Secondly, you don't remember it because you didn't use it. I don't think any, well, maybe some people here have used that, that theorem, but I would suspect today you're not gonna use that theorem. By the way, if you do, give me a call. Right? But watch, maybe worship is designed to remind us of who God is. Because in life, we can forget who God is. Let me go back to the math equation for a second. In the 1980s, ANW tried to compete with McDonald's Quarter Pounder by selling one third pound of beef at a lower price. It didn't sell. It failed because most people thought one third of a pound was less than a quarter. <laughs> people can forget stuff. We can forget God. Now we gotta remember God. Let's stand up and worship God.
Let us pray. Father God, thank you for this beautiful day. Thank you for this facility that we can worship uh, you today. We, we sing praises to you. We'll be singing songs with hallelujah in there and praise to you, only you. Those who might be cluttered in their mind about everyday problems, let them empty it and concentrate only on you. Soften our hearts. Those who are going through troubles right now, smile through the tears because we know God's got this. Thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who died for our sins. We love you and love him so very much. In his name we pray. Amen.
Let's pray. Father, in Psalm 105, verse 5, it says this. Remember the wonders you have done, his miracles and the judgment he pronounces. Father, the last song said it best. All we have to offer you is a hallelujah. Father, that means praise you. And Father, we do praise you for what you do for us. Father, we praise you for what you did for us. And Father, we praise you for what you will do for us. You're awesome. Thank you for being who you are. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. It's good to see you all here this morning, August 4th, right? Am I on the right date? I hope I'm standing up here today, so it's hopefully August 4th. I hope you have had a good time, I hope, enjoying the Olympics, because I have loved the Olympics. I love watching the different sports that sometimes you normally don't get to see, and there are some amazing moments you see in those when you stay up late watching the Olympics and realize, ooh, I better not watch that next set in men's volleyball. But the U.S., they were winning against Japan. And had to, it's, ooh. There was a woman from Guatemala, skeet shooting, trap is what they call it. And I was just mesmerized of how good she was. And she was in the final, and she won the gold set an Olympic record, but it was their country's only third medal ever. The second one was won the day before by the, a man in the same category. So they had only had won their whole time in the Olympics. And it was an exciting moment. She was very emotional at the end, obviously. And you see these moments and you just love, even last night there was a huge upset in the 100 meter. And a lady from St. Lucia, I believe, never has won, their country had never won any medals. And she wins gold. Oh, it just gives me goosebumps thinking about it. I love sports. And I love playing sports and watching sports. And this is a time when you watch the Olympics, you watch some things, you learn some things. Okay, did you know that the fastest event is badminton. They can hit that little thing. I know what it's called, but I just felt like it wasn't the best thing to say. So I know what it's called. I played it. But it can be hit up to 200 miles an hour. 200 miles an hour. Now you might not believe that because I've played badminton before and my hits are not 200 miles an hour. But if you watch the championship match with China and South Korea, I have never seen people move so fast and so hard on 44 feet of playing surface. It was so much fun to watch and so intense. I never thought that I'd be so excited to watch badminton. There are so many different things that we have. And, and maybe you have things that you remember as a kid playing games in the backyard. One of my favorite memories was my next door neighbor or a couple neighbors down. We would play wiffle ball in his backyard all the time. I mean, all the time. And I loved it. And I was never a home run hitter. I was always taught to hit, you know, level. So I would hit more, but they would often try to do the home runs over the fence. But I always thought though, for me, I couldn't, if I left, it was okay. But if the guy at the house decided, you know what? I'm done for the day. I'm going to take the wiffle ball and go home. Now, I also realize this is not a wiffle ball. I do know my sports. This may bring back some bad memories for you, though, because this is actually a dodgeball. Now, when I was dodgeball was a kid, those dodgeballs left marks on your face. Kids these days, they have it so easy. This is so soft. Oh. But... If we were playing a sport that involved a ball like this, or a ball similar, such as basketball, and I'm playing on the courts, and I get mad because someone fouled me and they wouldn't let the foul be called, guess what I'm doing? I'm taking my ball and going home. And guess what? They're not going to be able to play now because they have no ball to play with. 
unless someone else brought a basketball, but usually there was just like one. And, and it's interesting, we have that expression, take my ball and go home. And I see that a lot, with, especially with young kids, when they have something that they like, and then another young kid like, ooh, I like that too, they're not going to do well together because they haven't really learned yet. Unfortunately, some adults never got out of that level either. And sometimes we have that attitude of like, well, I'm just, I don't like this person. I don't like what they just said to me, so I'm going to take my ball and go home. But that is not what God desires for us. We're in the middle of a series of Be the Church. We have a sign over here of the, of the community of Muncie. And if you have not been here, those handprints are people that maybe you have thought of or praying about. They may not know Jesus. They may just need something in their life that's different. And today we're going to continue that series, but today we're going to see that we are here to share. So if you have your Bible, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We're going to be looking at verses 11 to 21 today. And Paul writes this to the church at Corinth. And Corinth, they had a lot of, a lot of problems. In the first letter we see, it seems a lot of questions maybe they had or things that were going on. And so Paul would answer those questions. But there was a lot of problems going on too. But there were, there were some that were, that were faithful. At every church we see that was written in the New Testament, that there, were, there was always at least a handful, or Paul wouldn't have wasted his time writing a letter to him. And we see in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, starting in verse 11, we're going to see that Paul wants us to be real. He wants us to be real. We're going to look at 11 to 15. So follow along with me if you have it. Since then, we know what it is to fear the Lord. We try to persuade others. What we are is plain to God, and I hope it is also plain to your conscience. We are not trying to commend ourselves to you again, but we're giving you an opportunity to take pride in us so that you can answer those who take pride in what is seen rather than what is in the heart. If we are out of our mind, as some say, it is for God. We are in our right mind, it is for you. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. When we look at this idea of being real, I don't like fake. I don't like fake products that supposedly just like the original. I don't like people who are fake, who may say one thing to my face and then say something behind my back. And I'm sure that you don't like that type of person either. There aren't many people that I know that are like, oh yes, I love talking to that person. And I know they talk behind my back about me, but it's okay. I mean, they say at least nice things to my face. Paul was one who was a great writer. He was not necessarily a great orator or a great speaker. And in that day, it was very, very popular to be a great speaker. The sophists were ones who really strived to be great speakers. And if you were not a great speaker, well, no one is going to listen to you. And so we see this start to take place here when he's talking about this being real. And you see in verse 11, he says, since then, we know what it is to fear the Lord. Do you see what he says next? We try to persuade others. God understands how great, Paul understands how great God is. He understands the magnitude of it all. 
the power of the one that he speaks about. And because of that reason, he tries to persuade others to follow Jesus. But the thing with Paul, he admits he was not the best speaker. He admits that he was not better than many of those who spoke in that day. But the one thing is you go on with that. He says, but what we are is plain to God, and I hope it's also plain to your conscience. He wants him to realize, look, I may not be the best speaker, but I'm being real with you. I'm not giving you something that isn't true. This is very true, and I may not be able to say it the best way, but it is true. As we look at this, and he continues on, there was no hidden agenda from Paul. There was nothing suspicious about what he was doing. He laid it out for them. And it was for them to decide what to do with it. But he wasn't there to impress them. He wasn't there to try to make a good show about it. No, he wanted to persuade others about Jesus. That was what he was wanting to do. To be a witness of Jesus, to be able to say, I want to share this with you. And I'm going to be real when I talk to you about it. You may not like what I have to say, but it is the truth. It's not smoke and mirrors. It's the truth. Because you see, as we go a little bit further there, that he, sa he asked them, he says, I want you to take pride in us. Now Paul did not have necessarily a complex that he wanted the pats on the back. He says, I want you to take pride in us so that you can answer those who take pride in what is seen rather than is what is in the heart. And it's interesting, in another translation, it says that they... <clears throat> How should I say it? It, he, he wants them to understand it's not a show. It's about what's in the heart. He, he wants them to understand that he is seeking out God. The heart of God. When he presents this to them. And he is not seeking the applause of men. He was real. He did not want them to think in any other way that he was trying, they were trying to be fooled by what was being presented to them. So he wanted them to take pride in them. So when others questioned, well, he's not a good speaker. Why are you listening to him? I trust Paul. I trust what he's saying. I trust in the words that he is giving to us. I trust that he is talking the truth. So it's not about the applause of man. It's about the heart of God. And when we are real, people see that. They notice it. It's maybe easy to be real around people that are similar to you. But not so much maybe when someone has different thoughts or opinions or may look different. And you be like, oh, I don't know if I can, can actually put on that good face. We shouldn't be trying to be putting on the mask to pretending like, hey, we've got it all together. Because I know we don't. At least if you do, I want to talk to you afterwards. Because this was one of those weeks it was like, whoo, okay, this came up today. And, and then there were some praises during the week and there were some, some amazing things that happened. And there's just moments that make you stop and just say, thank you, God. And I had one this morning during Bible discovery. And it was just a simple text that made my morning But it's because 
I was real. And they appreciated that. And I wonder, why would we want to be fake? Why would we want to be someone we're not when we're talking about the best thing ever? When we're talking about Jesus, it's very easy for us to be able to have a mask to put on, to look good in front of people. But God doesn't care about that. He doesn't care if it's one person or 20 or 50 or 1,000 or even a million that you might have an opportunity to talk to. Sometimes those one-on-one -on -one conversations are just as powerful, if not more powerful, than a group of hundreds or thousands. But the thing that really drives me in this section is verse 14. For Christ's love compels us. We look at this world and we get so frustrated. We get frustrated by the things that happen in this world and we don't have answers a lot of times of like what to do with this or how to handle this. But I wonder, as a Christian, are we being real with those around us? Are we truly being real and realizing that the people around us, Jesus loves. And his love compels us. In another translation it says, it controls us. In the message, which is a paraphrase, but I love how it's said, it says, it has moved me to such extremes. This is not something that's subtle. Christ's love is, is powerful. And when we have that in our lives, what is holding us back from being a witness and sharing to those we love? Because if we truly love them, we would want them to know about Jesus. He died for all people, it says. Even people we might not agree with. Even people we might not like how they look. Even people from different backgrounds. The thing, as I mentioned, I love with the Olympics is a taste of what could be in heaven someday. Every tribe, every nation. But Christ's love compels us to share. He died for all. So he says, live for him and not yourself. And that goes to where we come to verses 16 to 19, I want you to check your point of view because when we have the opportunity to be real in our life every day, we need to check our point of view. Listen to what he has to say there in verses 16 to 19. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We need to be checking our point of view because you see, there are two views we can have. We, we can have the world's view, but I consider that the old life because we've been changed because of Jesus. But God's point of view, the new life. You see what he says there? You are now a new creation. If you are in Christ, you are a new creation. Our point of view should be changing. When we become a follower of Jesus, our point of view changes. At least it should. 
because we have a different perspective now. We look at people differently. We should. If not, we need to examine our hearts. Because every person is precious in God's sight. Every person is made in his image. And every person needs Jesus. And we see here in verses 16 to 19, he says, So from now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view. The thing that I have heard that I, that I hear often from those who may not be a follower of Jesus is that Christians are negative. That should be the opposite of what we are called to be. We're always bringing out the negative in things. We have the greatest hope for every person on this earth and yet we hold back from sharing that. We take our ball and go home because we're mad at that person and we don't feel like they deserve to be told about Jesus. Because we're mad at them. We're mad at maybe what they did but we have to realize we try to put the world on this pedestal and say, you, you have to do the things as a Christian does. But they don't even know Jesus. How can we expect them to be on that level if they don't know Jesus? I had the opportunity, oh, this makes me feel old saying this, but I was a dean at camp about two weeks ago at the Ark Christian Ministries. And I believe this has now been my 25th year as a dean. Whoa, that, that deserves a round of applause because there have been a couple times that there were a couple weeks. One summer it was back to back weeks. That was a really rough two weeks. But man, 51 third to fifth graders. Oh. It was so much fun. Yeah, yeah, it was. We had two baptisms at the end of the week. We, the theme this year was defined. And how, and I took that as how we are defined by God. So we had six different sessions that we looked at different things of how God views us. Because we often let the world define us. And God says, no, the world does not define you. Now, I just want just a, a quick plug with this because if you haven't heard this song, go check it out after the service. But Unspoken has a song called What God Thinks About You. Okay, check that out. We play that every morning session. It was totally a God thing. When I was planning this and my sessions, this song comes out and I'm listening on the radio one day. Four of my six points were in this. Were in this and I'm just like, Whoa, this is totally God. This is awesome. So we played this every morning. The kids loved it. Because it talks about you're being chosen. You are loved. You are forgiven. And one of my favorite times during the camp has always been the missions time. And if you're not familiar with camp, they usually have one missionary for the whole summer that speaks to every camp that comes through for the summer. And this year, there were two women from Spain that worked together. And one thing that really stood out to me was one of the, the first times they were talking to the kids. And they helped the kids to understand the need of Jesus in Spain. And, and she showed, like, how many Christians are in America. And then she showed how many Christians are in Spain. 1.6 percent of Spain's population is considered a Christian. 1.6. And she had a great visual because she had dyed these, the rice, and they were red. And, the, and then there was white rice in there, and there was not many red rice in there compared to what even we have here in America. And it's still below 50 percent for true, devouted, church-going people 
And so in that environment, it's got to be very tough to change people's point of view. But the thing that I loved was how a ministry started that they didn't expect it to really be a ministry and now it is their main part of their ministry. They were at a park there in Spain that many people hung out during the day and, and you know, play games or just hang out, whatever that you do in a park. And they noticed, man, let's just bring a cornhole set just start playing. Maybe if we see if we get a few people to, to show up. And it got blown up. Like, they started this cornhole league. They have this, they rent out this facility and they help people. They, they bring people in. They're playing cornhole. If you've never played cornhole, it's, I feel like it's a Midwest game, but I, obviously it may not be. It's now international. Because this team, they, they, they were helping people along with that and they were just finding their basic needs and having conversations with them. And one thing that really stood out to me, 1.6%, they were trying to change the point of view of many of the people around them. And they've used social media on reaching out and, and different ways because of this cornhole that they started using. And they said since the beginning of this year, and this may not sound like to us much because we probably have 150, 200 in this room, they passed out 16 Bibles to different families, 16 different families this year. And, and it's, you know, it's like, it's not much. I have 16 in my office. But what got me is they had a video of one of the women that got a Bible. And tears were coming down her face. She always had wanted one, but never, know, never knew where to find one. And they are using that, they are helping that to change people's point of view of the world, but also to be able to plant seeds to tell people about Jesus. And so we had that opportunity for our old life to the new life. And we see there, he says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. He says there in verse 17. But God has reconciled us to himself. He has brought us back because we have been separated because of sin. He says there towards the end of that, notice what he says. He says, all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. He gave us the ministry of reconciliation. What does that mean? That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed us to us the message of reconciliation. God has given us reconciliation. We are now able to stand in the presence of God because of Jesus. But it doesn't stop there. Because we are called to be a witness, to share, to let others be in the presence of Jesus. So that they can then share and be a part of something bigger than themselves. Something bigger than anything in this world. So we're to be real. I want you to check your point of view, but I finally, I want you to represent well. As I mentioned with the Olympics, it is amazing to watch people with their countries and representing with their flag or with the music if, if they win a medal and, and the pride that they have standing on that podium with two other people who did well, but not well enough for their song to be played. Because if you get first, you get the song to be played, right? And that is a moment that they're standing there proud, representing their country, representing well in that moment. I've read that they, different countries reward their athletes in different ways. Some pay them money. There, there was one country that actually, if you win any medal, they give you like a house. And if you get silver, you get a bigger house. If you get gold, you've got a really nice house. And 
There are different ways that maybe a country might be able to encourage them or to, to represent them. To honor them saying, thank you for representing us. But look what Paul says there in verses 20 and 21. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf. Be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. So that in him we might become the righteousness of of God. I haven't shared this with many people, but this has been a dream of mine for many years, and it may just be a dream. I've always wanted to write a novel, a, a big classic. Maybe not a classic, but something written. And, and, and the, the title of it would be The Cure, okay? And here's the scene. You set up the scene. This man is in a cheap hotel, He's laying, he's sweating in the bed, he's hot. He just, he's exhausted. And outside you see the no vacancy sign lit up. And he's thinking to himself, why? Why can't I just give the cure to everybody? I can, but I'm afraid. And it was like kind of an allegory about like telling people about Jesus. That's all I got. I just got like the first two pages, you know. But, but, so no one take that from me, you know. If, don't make that into a movie or something. But, but. But the thing is, I've always thought about that. That's, that's where I get stuck. I'm just like, what next? Well, let's just put that on the shelf. But my thought with it, though, is that we are called to be an ambassador of Christ. We are called to be a representative of Jesus. That is a big call. Because when someone is an ambassador, you know what they are doing? They are speaking on behalf of the person that sent them. And we are being sent, and we need to represent well. Are we doing that? Are we being real with those around us? Are we, are we having the right point of view in the way that we look at the world? and the, Not necessarily the world, but the people in this world. Because if we do, we might have that opportunity to be able to represent well, to be able to be a witness, to be able to share the best news ever. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us, through me, yes, through you and through me. That's a great responsibility. <laughs> And it's one we often say, it's a great responsibility. And that's all we do with it. Because that's a big task. But we are called to be representing well. If more people saw Jesus represented in our lives, through our words, through our actions... I think more people would be joining us in the kingdom. More people would be coming to know Jesus. You are an ambassador. When I talk about being defined, that's one of those words. We are being represented. We are representation. We are represented. We're ambassadors for Christ. And so... When we do that, we represent well. And when we do that, we have opportunities to be able to share. Because we see in, in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, Paul writes to Timothy in this, and he says, Who wants all people to be saved? He's talking about God here. And to come to a knowledge of the truth. God desires for all people to be saved. All people. Now, like I said, this may scare you. No. And what I would like to do right now, Charlie, is now, be very careful with this. Okay? Oh, it was a little short. Sorry. Oh, good catch. Good catch. All right. 
in the back. All right, and I'm gonna do one over here. I'm gonna do another one with teens. Oh, a little short, all right. So now, we have six dodgeballs. You should be very awake at this moment. <laughs> now, my thing is what I want you to do with that dodgeball is not to throw someone at, at someone, but to throw it to them, especially if they raise their hand politely, okay? Please make sure they are looking at you when you throw it, okay? So throw it to someone else right now, okay? It doesn't matter who. It could be someone in your section or someone in a different section. And then now I want that person to throw it to someone else. All right. Now don't lose any of my dodgeballs. All right, now do that again. Share that again. Share that again with someone in the back or someone up front, okay? Do it a couple more times. You, you guys are doing great. Seeing the green in the back there. All right, I see one back here. All right, that's nice. Oh, nice. Oh! Vicky just took out Carly. All right. Isn't sharing fun? Isn't sharing fun when you are able to throw that ball to someone else? Okay, it's getting out of hand here now, right? All right. That's what happens when the dodgeballs come out. You lose control because it is fun to share. It's no fun to take the ball and to go home. You can complain, you can, you can gripe, you can do all these things and say, I'm just going to stay in my house and not talk to anybody. And that's, that's okay, you could do that. But you might be missing out an opportunity to be able to share the good news message. The message that we have been given as ambassadors of Christ to share to this world. To share to your household to your neighborhood, to your community, to your state, to the country, to the world. And when we do that, God, he will do great things. Would you stand with me? As we pray, Lord, thank you. Thank you for a great responsibility. It, it could be intimidating. It could be, I, I'm not sure what to say. I'm not sure what to do. I just pray that you give us the right words to say in those conversations. That you give us opportunities to be able to, to talk about you. To talk about how great you are. Because there's nothing in this world that is better. And we have been given that opportunity to do this daily, to be the church, to be witnesses for you, and to be able to share the good news. And it's good news for a reason. I pray right now, just be with us, guide us in everything that we do. And I pray right now, Lord, if there is someone that may need prayer today, that maybe they go to, that, to the next steps room right now to be able to pray. To be able to talk to someone and say, I need prayer in this area. Or you, they may have more questions about knowing this good news. I pray if you put that on their heart, put them over in that direction right now as we are praying, as we are standing, as we are lifting up your name. And right now, Lord, there may be someone in our life or people in our life that you have put in our path. And right now, Lord, I pray that we think of that person, we pray for that person, and we pray for opportunities to let your light shine in us. Because there is nothing better, nothing better than you. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated.
I'm going to go ahead and turn over. And I, please, I would like my dodgeballs back. <laughs> you can hand them to me and not at me. Thank you. <clears throat> well, good morning. I've been at the state fair the past few days. If I knew he was bringing dodgeballs, I'd brought some cow patties back. Are you kidding? <laughs> <laughs> oh. <clears throat> As we get ready for our time of communion this morning, if you didn't grab one of the cups, um, raise your hand and one of the deacons will get you. Get you all set up with what you need. Okay. Uh, this past week I was going down State Road 32 at a pretty good speed as I usually do. And all of a sudden I look up and I see this sign with yellow flashing right lights around it. It says, speed limit 45 when flashing. Well, I was going considerably faster than 45, but uh, might have been going 65, I don't know, but I hit the brakes and slowed down, and well, the sign was in front of Monroe Central High School. I thought, man, is it already time to go back to school? Things change. August is here, right? What happened to May, June, and July? I think they disappeared. And uh, of course, the next question is how many shopping days till Christmas, right? You know. <clears throat> but August is here, and I received an email a couple weeks ago I thought was really good. Talked about in August a lot of new things happen. Uh, the Cubs win a game. Um, a day game. <laughs> um, school starts back up. Maybe you're going to a new school. Uh, hopefully you're in a new grade. Um, um, if it's not school, maybe it's a job, a lot of new jobs. Uh, seems like in the fall, you know, as schools get back in session, maybe you got a new teaching job, maybe, maybe your job is, is moved, maybe you've got a, a promotion, those kinds of things. Uh, football season's going to be starting, that's something new, kind of look forward to that. Um, so a lot of new things happen. Not just in August, but, you know, every month of the year. But things are always changing. And the point of the email, <clears throat> and what reminded me going down 32, is that as things change, we need to be sure we take Jesus along with us. It's so easy to get caught up and get busy, and I got to do this, and I got to do that, and when something's new, uh, no matter what it is, it takes more time, usually, to start with. But we need to make sure that we're taking Jesus with us as we go. I want to read from Proverbs chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. It says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus the pioneer, the perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who entrusted, who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. You know, as we share in communion this morning, fix our eyes upon Jesus. There are so many distractions in this world. We need to take time, not only on Sunday morning, to fix our eyes on Jesus as we remember what he did for us on the cross, but every day of the week, be sure we focus on his sacrifice that covers our sin. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we thank you for the, this very special time that we have each week to, to meet around your tables. Remember the the broken body and the shed blood of Christ, Father, as he was crucified on the cross, as he died, Father, but then he was raised from the dead, overcoming sin and death that we might live through him. We thank you for that gift. May we always fix our eyes on what Jesus 
has done for us and never lose sight of that special gift. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There's a place where mercy reigns and never dies. There's a place where streams of grace flow deep and wide. So there is a lot going on in the bulletin, but there are a few things I want to address. Wait, 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 this breaking news. Wait, yes. Paris could not handle all the Olympics. What? So next week, yeah, that's correct. Next week here, there will be a family Olympic event for preschool and elementary families and they're serving crepes. That is really good. So, 
next week. There will be a family Olympic event after the church. We will be here in the Life Center. And I encourage all families with preschoolers or elementary, there will be stuff for all of them to be able to do and to do as a family. And so I encourage you to do that, kind of a back-to-school event for the kids. I'm really looking forward to it as Paris will be closing, but Olympics in Muncie will be starting. So please come and join us for that next week. Also, in the back, there is a uh, board for the missions team. Uh, we, we have a couple families that are going to be doing some great mission work this fall. And there are some, this opportunity, if you can't go, to be able to help them to go. And so they need the money in by next Sunday. So today there's a spot back there. If not, see Marianne in the office during the week and drop that off and she will make sure that gets to them. And also next week, Bible discovery time for the adults will be in here because you will get to hear from the Bousmans about their trip to Ecuador. And so a great opportunity to be able to hear of some mission work and some opportunities they had through Operation Christmas Child uh, to be able to share that with you next week with that. So that will be all adult classes will be in here next week for that as well. And just to plug, I know it's coming up at the end of the month, but you don't want to miss Sunday night, August 25th. Justin Hart is a former children's minister and a former science teacher and he combines them and it is a wonderful thing for the family to be able to see. I've seen bits and pieces of it at conferences before and he does an amazing job. It's our big event for the outreach teams coming and so be able to invite families to that. Um, there's so much come and be feds coming up and, and also with that first night is a back to school night that's going to be a, a time of prayer for teachers and for families. And speaking of, a pink insert is a prayer guide for August. To, to look that over, pray about that, look at the verses that they give you to recommend for this month to be able to go to God in prayer. Other things that are happening up a little bit down the road, I want you, but I want to turn it over to Rob right now. Where'd he go? Oh, there he is. All right. Good morning. My name's Rob Tyler. I'm here representing the stewardship team. About a year ago, two couples approached the leadership here at University Christian Church with a vision to accelerate the repayment of our mortgage debt from our two construction projects in 2009 and 2014. At that time, we had two loans with variable interest rates that are scheduled to likely increase next month. And so these two couples committed $150,000 to match contributions from the congregation that will be directly applied to our debt balances. So last year on October 15th, we announced our pay down to build up one year matching debt reduction campaign. And I'm here today to give you an update on the progress through the end of July. So a year ago, 63 families made a pledge totaling $170,332. More than the matching money. So that was exciting to know we're gonna get all the matching money. 35 families have already made or given 100% of their pledges. So that's encouraging that more than half the people that made pledges have already finished their pledges. Those total of pledges received is $148,330. So that's fantastic. Seven families made no pledge but have contributed. That's cool. $3,361 from seven families that didn't make a pledge. So total contributions from the congregation so far, $151,690. Total matching funds received so far 135,000. So since we crossed the 150, the other 15,000 will follow in matching funds. So, so far we've received $286,690. As a result, the phase one loan has already been paid off. Amen. We, we knocked that out <clears throat> since last October. When the phase two mortgage gets refinanced later this year, we'll have a much lower balance to refinance at potentially a higher rate. So that's been great. So thank you for accepting the challenge and securing 100% of the matching money. Finish strong here over the next couple of months. And even if you didn't make a pledge, you can jump in and join us as we, we round this out here over the next couple of months. Also want to announce the stewardship team is planning a stewardship class starting September 8th. So Sunday nights starting September 8th for six weeks. 
The material is from Ron Blue. If you're familiar with the Ron Blue Institute or Ron Blue, he does a lot of stewardship training across the country. The video series is called God Owns It All. And we'll be uh, meeting, watching the video, everybody gets a workbook, and then discussing how we can biblically improve on our own uh, personal stewardship. So that starts Sunday nights for six weeks beginning September 8th. Thanks, Michael. Awesome. Praise God. Love hearing just how God uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things. So would you stand with me? Please make sure that I get my dodgeballs back. And if you could help with the chairs afterward, that would be greatly appreciated. Yes? I think you should tell Elizabeth. Well, we, this is a weird thing that we're trying to still figure out. That So Elizabeth had um, an eye appointment the other day. She wears glasses. Really bad vision, actually. And... Uh, even when she was doing the test the other day, she could barely read the first or second line. And they dilated her eyes to check stuff out. And then Kelly was going to get a new prescription for her. And Elizabeth, the next day, she was like, oh, my eyes are feeling weird. And we were like, yeah, yeah, that happens. And the next day, she tried putting on her glasses and they just didn't seem right. And she's like, I could see better without my glasses. And we're like, what are you talking about? And so for two days now, she has been without her glasses and she can see without the need for glasses. And I'm like, it's gotta be a radioactive spider somewhere. <laughs> so I was going to call her spider girl or something, but, but it can only be of God. And it's just, yeah, he's amazing. Woo! So. So let's, let's pray as I do with the kids. Snap, clap, hands in the lap. Let's pray. Father God, you are good. We thank you for today. We thank you for every person that is here, for every person that is watching online. And we thank you for our mission. The mission field is much needed today, Lord. Help us to be able to have the courage to be able to share, to share the good news. And we pray for the things that are coming up here at the church and within our community. Lord, may these things bring honor to you and all that we do, because we do it for your glory. And we pray for a great week ahead. We give it to you, Lord, in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. Have a great week.